Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're excited about the service and all that the Lord is going to do through his word. As we begin tonight, let's sing a song together that helps us to reflect on what it is that we are, and that is only a sinner saved by grace. Let's stand together and we'll sing all the stanzas of this. Not have I gotten but what I received. Praise have bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I amaze. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Once I was foolish and sin ruled my heart, causing my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus hath found me happy my case. I now am a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Verse 4, suffer a sinner whose heart overflows. Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows. Once more to tell it, Lord, I embrace. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved. By grace. Thank you. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you, my brother. What good singing this evening. God bless you for being here on a Monday night. Some of you haven't been in church on Monday night in years. Still looks the same in here, doesn't it? Doesn't change. Hey, thank you for being here. God bless you. We appreciate it so very much. We rejoice in the Lord's goodness. I want to thank all of you, dear folks, that are here in the auditorium, and we have folks in the gym that are streaming the service at this time, and we're delighted to have them as well. And then I think about so many of them in their homes and other places uh, across this country and around the world. I'd like to say that anyway, around the world that are streaming in this evening and shall see this uh, service in the days to come. And we pray the Lord will use it. We just finished praying about that, that God would indeed uh, bless. Listen, God blesses his word. Isaiah said the word of God would not return void. And so we can, we can rejoice in that promise that God has given to us. I really believe the word of God will be shared with us this evening. And the Lord can use it to uh, just revive our hearts. We are so concerned. Just praise the Lord for yesterday. But we're so concerned about those who will visit and uh, be under the sound of the message of the gospel that have never trusted Christ as their Savior. That's, that's our main burden, folks, that people will understand the need of a Savior. You won't understand that until you understand you're a sinner and that you are guilty and you're helpless and hopeless without Christ. He's the only way. And I pray that the Lord will tug in our hearts. And I'm so glad many years ago, uh, the Lord shared that message through uh, to me and through my pastor and my parents and just rejoice there again that after almost 62 years, I'm still saved, still on my way to heaven. And I rejoice in that. Amen, brother. Amen. So God bless you. Thank you for being here. We rejoice in what the Lord has for us. Let me remind us, dear folks, that we are at this time having this meeting. It's what uh, often has been called Passion Week. And I was reading this afternoon in John chapter 18 and 19. Can I encourage you, uh, uh, chapter John chapter 18, 19, 20, and 21. Would you kind of camp out in those four chapters here this week? I would encourage you to do that. It will bless your heart 
again, to go through the trials that our Savior went through and also to see how that triumphantly the Lord gave his life, that we may have life. You say triumphantly for someone to die? He's just not someone. He's the God-man. And folks, he arose from the grave. And praise the Lord, on that Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. And folks, that's our victory. That's our victory. And I trust that you'll understand that and read that. Try to camp out again, as I said, uh, in those passages this week. Uh, let me share with you some things. Our children's meeting, and Brother uh, Jimmy's going to come and give some announcements as well. But our children's meeting begins uh, tonight. And uh, uh, Mrs., uh, uh, not Heather, but... Angela, she's going to start our meeting, and we look forward to that for our children. Are you ready to go, children? Don't go yet, because nobody's back there. I better shut my mouth. But anyway, uh, can I share something with you, a little special need? Um, Miss Heather, uh, she's not in here. She's in the back. There she is right there. Uh, don't mean to embarrass her, but this is going to be her last uh, summer traveling with mom and dad. And she's going to work at Pensacola Christian College. And uh, we praise the Lord for that. I praise the Lord. Listen, it's not only mom and dad, but the children of an evangelist. They, they have to be involved in the work. And I'll tell you that uh, Miss Heather has done that. And we're proud of her. And she, uh, she is just a, a really deserving lady going to serve the Lord. You know what I'd like to do? Can we designate the offering Wednesday night? What is it? Monday night. We've got tomorrow night. And then, we, of course, we have Thursday and Friday night. Can we designate the offering Wednesday night to go to Heather Tozer? Can we do that? Is that okay? All in favor? Take your pocketbooks out and <laughs> billfolds out. Amen. Let's do that, okay? We'll be a blessing to her. Is it all right if I embarrass you doing that? That's okay to embarrass you to doing that. <clears throat> you want to be a part of our, you are a part of our family. Did I understand you said that you've been here nine times? I think that's right. We started in 08, and it's been about every other year. Yeah, so yeah. So, uh, wow, these these people are part of our family. So let's be let's be helpful. Uh, and uh, as she uh, goes goes to Pensacola and begins uh, another chapter in her life, and so let's think about that Wednesday night. You say I'm not going to be here Wednesday night. We'll write a check. Write a check. Do it tonight. And we would appreciate that. I wanted to mention that uh, as Brother Jimmy's coming at this time. Let me share with you some prayer requests. Uh, Alice Williams uh, asked that we pray for her brother, Robert Allen. He's in Duke Raleigh, he's not doing well, and we ask you to please be praying for him, Robert Allen. And then Brother Tom Walker was with us yesterday, and we just found out that he's in the hospital and uh, not doing well. So pray for Tom Walker. And uh, we, we, everybody here that comes to Bible Baptist knows Brother Tom. And I know that uh, he'll appreciate us praying for him. So please do that. Pastor, would you come and share with us some more announcements? Um, also, I was going to mention, for those that may have been in the early service, I talked to Miss Francine Ebron uh, this morning. And uh, Brother Cliff was doing much better. They were able to bring him home. He had a, a spell out here in the early service. And um, they're seeing his heart doctor and all, but he is at home. She said he was fussing, wanting to eat, stuff like that. So that means he's feeling better. But I just want to let some of you that knew that uh, about him. But keep praying for him because he does have some appointments that he's got to meet. And maybe they can figure out what what what, what, went, on, what went on yesterday morning. But uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday evening, excuse me, Wednesday evening, uh, for those that have, have used and invited the most people, the man and the woman, I do have a special gift for you. So keep working at that. Uh, we, you can't make anybody come, but uh, I'd like to at least ward people for uh, uh, a strong effort to invite people to come. So if you'll keep up with your number, we deal with honesty around here, and the Lord will deal with anything else you have a problem with. So we'll, uh, we'll go with it like that. But I do have some special gifts for those, for the man and woman that have invited the most people to come this week. So uh, we look forward to that, and that'll be Wednesday evening. Sing one more time with me tonight, Whiter Than Snow. Standing as we sing, Whiter Than Snow. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out.
Jesus looked down from your throne in the skies and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 3, this will be the last. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at your crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see your blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Thank you. You can be seated. Okay. Let me, while Brother David is coming to sing for us tonight, let me just say again, thank you for being with us. And for those of you that may be watching for the first time or someone visiting this evening, it's a delight to have Rich Tozer, his dear wife and uh, daughters with us this evening ministering to us. And we appreciate them so very much. And uh, our Brother Tozer, what a blessing yesterday. Amen. What a blessing. Two messages that were right on target for my heart. And I trust that the message tonight will be that will encourage us and challenge us as we look to the Lord. And I pray that we understand how important this, this time is. Do you understand that? Let me encourage you to pray. Let me encourage you to pray for our speaker. Let me encourage you to remember all that goes on this week. Again, beginning tonight, Miss Angela will be with the children and they'll be blessed and hear the gospel. And we're praying, praying indeed that the Lord will accomplish that which he has in his heart and his mind. And so let's pray much. Uh, Brother David Cash. I'm glad you're here. And I like your piano player, too. He's a good guy. You'll sound better with a piano. Amen. And then Brother Rich will come and preach. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still that calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone, because
Cause I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives And then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's final war with pain And then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know He reigns because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I know, I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives My life is worth the living Just because He lives Good. Well, let me get this one turned on. Life worth living? If you have the Lord, it's worth living. He's given you a purpose, and I'm grateful for that. Thanks for singing and playing there, guys. Sure appreciate it. I should clarify, Heather is actually not working at the college at Pensacola Christian. She's moving to Pensacola, but she's, she's got another service job lined up. She's taking care of a lady down there that goes to my daughter and son-in-law's church. So I don't know if we still are allowed to take an offering for her because she's caregiver so okay am i absolved okay yeah okay all right so i i may have lost that in translation angela and i you know graduated from pcc so did our other daughter and i'm sure pastor assumed when i said she's moving to pensacola but yeah she this is probably uh second to last month she'll be with us looks like in may we'll be at michael and candace's church y'all remember michael and candace who used to do children's meetings we got a 10-day meeting lined up there and uh, that'll be Heather's last hurrah with us, I think. So we're looking at getting a car and helping her get in a place. So anyway. All right. Heather's going to help her mom. And so Angela and Heather are going to head out with the kids. And so you're up to fourth grade. You get to go out this way with my wife and daughter to do kids class. So all those up to fourth grade, you guys can go out. Good job. You paid attention really well. The rest of us are going to go to Psalm 91 tonight, if you would. Psalm 91. Thank you to all of you who prepared a meal tonight. Man, we had, whew, we had lasagna, we had pizza roll. I think that's all Pastor had, pizza roll. He loved that. Uh, we had chicken pot pie. We had all kinds of good stuff. I had it all. And I think there was a conspiracy. Feed the preacher enough and maybe he'll be quiet. What they didn't realize is, you know, hey, more calories, more energy. So now I can keep going. But no, I will not do that to you. All right, we're in Psalm 91 tonight. Thank you, ladies, for those of you who made the food. Many of you probably have heard that the, in the Greek culture, they had a habit of fashioning gods in the likeness of humans. You know, the God who made us says that he made man in his image. But the Greeks had rejected the concept of one universal God. They made gods in their own likeness. And they had multiple gods. In fact, one of these so-called gods was named Pan. He was the god of the forest and the fields. He was called the shepherd god. He was half human and half goat. In fact, he was known for playing a set of reed pipes. You may have heard of them referred to as pan pipes. Named for pan. The reason he was named pan, pan is the Greek word for all. And allegedly, he was adored by all the other gods because of his personality. He, he was licentious. But he was also genial, the friendly type of personality that had this charismatic type personality. 
And many times he was downright mischievous, according to their tradition. And it was said that he would hide in the forest, again, that was his domain, and when some unsuspecting traveler would come by, some Greek foot traveler, he would hide in the forest and he'd wait for the traveler to get close and he's hiding among the bushes and then he would shake the bushes and this would create a sense of apprehension in the person who couldn't see him. So then Pan would withdraw and run up ahead to where he could wait in another place along the pathway and here comes the foot traveler now, there's a sense of anxiety building and as they got near him, he would crack some sticks, or again, rustle some vegetation. And now the person is just sure that there's some pursuing beast in the field or in the forest. So again, his pace would quicken, and now he's hearing his heart beat with every step. And there's this building sense of worry, foreboding in the man who's now, or the person who's traveling by. So Pan would run up ahead, and again, he'd hide behind some rock or some place, and sometimes he'd let out a blood-curdling cry. And now the person walking was sure he was being pursued to death and take off in a full-out run, and Pan would just cackle in bewilderment. That is the origin of the term panic. Have you ever heard of panic? Have you ever experienced panic? The word panic comes from the name Pan, from the god Pan, and it's an uncontrollable fear or anxiety often causing wildly unthinking behavior. I have never seen such rampant panic in our country as I have in the last 12 months or so. Never forget when we were in Virginia last year, we had flown up to Kansas City, Angela and I had, for our pastor's retirement, and on the way back, our brand new pastor was just to be installed the next week, and we're flying back, and the plane's half empty. We're asking the flight attendant, I wouldn't expect the plane to be half empty like this. Is this about that? pandemic I've heard about? She said, yeah, we're not saying much about it in this industry, but she said, yeah, the flights have been half empty. And it was the next day that the NBA announced they were canceling their season for the year. Now, when, when some multi-billion dollar corporation cancels its season, you know something's up. I'd been watching golf, and I remember golf got underway in uh, TP, TPC Sawgrass down in Florida, and after day one, they canceled the season. What is going on? I remember we were in a church that week in Virginia, and they were recommending limiting crowd size. And then by the next week, the governor had, had made a, a law, or passed a mandate, rather, that you know they couldn't be any more than 10. It was the first week I would go to virtual meetings online. and Social distancing became a word. I, I'd never heard that term before, social distancing. And then mask mandates and covid it dominated the news night upon night upon night. Uh, there had been right before that impeachment proceedings. First time. Uh, they amounted to nothing. So then there's the pandemic panic, and so that was stirred up for a while. And then, oh, and then there were riots all summer. Cities being burned down. But except they were just peaceful protests. Antifa's not really actual, it's just figment of people's imagination. Really interesting that figments of imagination are burning down cities. But So that all went on all summer. And then, next thing you know, more impeachment proceedings. And then questions about voting and unrest. And then all the unrest at the Capitol, etc. I will tell you something. I've never seen such unrest in people. I, I, I am not surprised in the general populace, but I am astounded at how, unrest, how much unrest there has been in churches. Let me tell you something. It doesn't come from God. The Bible tells us that God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In John chapter 10, Jesus said this of Satan, the wicked one, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Let me ask you, are you experiencing that abundant life that God wants you to have? I want to go to Psalm 91 tonight. It is a psalm that by many over the years has been called the soldier's psalm. I think you'll see quickly why it was called that. I'm giving the title tonight, In the Habitation of the Most High. In the Habitation of the Most High. And you will see in the, verse, the very first verse why I would entitle it that. I'd like to read initially here verses 1 to 7. There are only 16 verses. I'll, uh, I'll give you an overview of all of them tonight, Lord willing. 
but I'd like you to stand with me if you're able. We'll read the first seven verses together. So Psalm 91, I'll read from verse 1 down to verse 7, then we'll have you be seated. You follow there if you would, and some of you have your Bible with you. If somebody near you has a Bible, just look on. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy, t at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. That is a psalm of protection. And God doesn't just say stuff to say things. God says things that he means. Be seated. Appreciate you standing with me. I'm going to break it down into three areas tonight. If you want to follow along, I'll make it easy to follow. We're going to start with this. Number one is a premise established. Premise, P-R-E, similar to the word promise. But a premise, many of you know, that's a, that is a foundational truth from which you derive other conclusions. We're going to start with a premise, and it's in verses 1 and 2. The whole psalm is predicated on this. Notice, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's interesting, there is no title given for this particular psalm. You notice between verse 1 and the, the title, there's nothing mentioned. Go to the previous one, though. go to Psalm 90. Interesting, between Psalm 90, uh, verse 1, and the head title, Psalm 90, there is a little inscription there. It says, a prayer of whom? Moses, yeah. That is the only psalm we know of for sure that Moses wrote. Interesting, this is one of the oldest pieces of Bible literature that we have. Psalm 90. In fact, it's, uh, it goes back to the time of the book of Job. And do, do you know that the first book written in the Bible was not the book of Genesis? Now, Genesis deals with the beginning of time, be beginning of things. Genesis is the starting point, but it wasn't the first book penned down. What book was written first, you know? Job, yeah, as far as we know, Job was written first. Isn't that interesting, too, by the way, the age-old question that so many people have, why does God allow suffering in this world? Isn't that interesting? That's what the book of Job addresses. It wasn't God who inflicted the suffering on Job. It was Satan, the archenemy of the soul, the archenemy of God. And interestingly, Psalm 90 was written about the time, around the time, maybe the book of Job was written. Now, if you notice Psalm 90, some have said, well, it seems that this one and the next psalm are companion psalms. Some have said maybe Moses wrote both. I, I don't know. Okay, But why they say this, look at Psalm 90, verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Sounds a lot like the next psalm. There are others who said, well, no, actually, Psalm 91, we believe, was written by David, probably written by David when he was fleeing from Saul. In fact, a number of the psalms were written in such circumstances. And so they see David's hand in it. Well, here's the truth of the matter. You read different commentaries, you'll come to different conclusions. Reality is God didn't tell us. But what's significant about this? I believe this is a general psalm. It's a general promise for people of all generations. This wasn't just for Moses, wouldn't have been just for David. This is a psalm for you and me. Okay, so what's the point of the psalm? Well, let me give you this premise. I, I made two observations here in verses 1 and 2. First of all, personal time with God is prioritized. Personal time with God prioritized. L look at, again, verse 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay, to dwell and abide are synonyms. I had a kid in California one time said, could I do an interview of you? I said, sure. He said, I need to interview somebody that travels in ministry, and you fit that bill. Okay, sure. And he said, okay, one of my questions is, what is your favorite chapter in the Bible? I'd never thought about that before. I mean, there are lots of chapters in the Bible I love, you know. But it wasn't going to cut it for me to say to this kid, oh, I like them all. Well, you know, that's not what he's looking to hear. So what's your favorite chapter? I'd never thought about that. So I thought, well, if I had to narrow it down to one, what might be a favorite chapter in the Bible? Well, one of them for sure would be John 15. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. 
Okay, that's the first five verses of, this, of uh, John 15. Why do I like that? It's talking about being in unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Having unbroken, constant fellowship with God. Well, let me ask you this. What is it that breaks fellowship with God? Sin does. I had a Bible teacher used to tell us, young people, you got to fess them when you do them, don't group them. <laughs> what did that mean? Well, so often we, we've been out of fellowship with God. You know, we lost our temper. We said something unkind. We thought a bad word or bad thought. And then at the end of the day, we try to go back and think, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I lost my temper. I said a bad thing. I was selfish. And, and we try to confess at the end of the day. And we've been out of fellowship with God for hours. No, the Bible teacher was good. He said, fess them when you do them. Don't group them. Okay, so getting instant confession of sin. See, once you know the Lord is Savior, here, here's a wonderful truth. You have a permanent relationship with God. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. One of my favorite scriptures when it comes to salvation is John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What's that mean? When you come to know the Lord as Savior, you have a forever relationship with God. Okay, he has everlasting life. Some of you may say, well, I don't believe in that doctrine of eternal security. I don't agree with you Baptists. Well, listen, I don't believe it just because I'm a Baptist. I believe it because it's Bible. Jesus says, if you believe on me, you have everlasting life. Let me ask you, if you have something, but then you lose it, could you really qualify that as being everlasting? No. He says, you have it, present tense. So when you get saved, you already have. It's not a layaway, folks. It's not like you get it when you get up there. You already have everlasting life when you're saved. Some people say, well, if I believe like that, well, I'd just go out and sin like the devil. No, you wouldn't. You underestimate God, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You know, I had an earthly dad. He didn't let me get away with anything. He loved me. I had a permanent relationship with him. But when I do wrong, there were consequences. When I do wrong, there was reckoning that came about. I got good illustration from this a couple months ago. We were out in West Virginia, and a guy said, we used to live near the train tracks when I was a kid, and he said these railroad cars would come by carrying coal, and that coal dust would shake off the train, and it would fall down into the ravine there under the trestle bridge, and he said, we kids would go climb and all that coal silt, you know, and he said, we'd come home blackened from head to toe, and he said, when I got to the house, he said, I will tell you something, I was always accepted at home, but I wasn't always acceptable at home. And as soon as I'd come to the door looking like that, my mother would say, ah, you are not coming in the house like that. Go out there, get that hose, you hose off, and then you go up and get a shower. He said, I'm always a son. I'm accepted at home, but not always acceptable at home. Okay, there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. Once you're saved, you've got a forever relationship with God. But let me tell you something, that doesn't mean you're in fellowship all the time. How do you stay in fellowship? Well, one, you keep short accounts. You confess it when you do wrong. Oh, by the way, somebody says to me, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, and they live like the devil, and there's no consequence in their life, then I have real reason to question whether they're genuinely a child of God. I mean, I don't let my kids get away with wrong. You claim you're a child of God, but you live like a child of the devil, and there's no indication that you're a child of God. Why do we assume you're a child of God without him chastening you? Because if he loves you, he does chasten you. Yeah, once you're saved, you are forever saved. The question is, have you been saved? What does it mean to be saved? Do you know for certain that you'll go to heaven one day? Are you sure that your sins have been cleansed by God? If you don't understand that, pay attention to this message. I'm going to explain it as we go through here. So, he that dwelleth, he dwells, he resides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Interesting, the term there for dwell and abide is ongoing constancy of fellowship. Notice he uses the term secret place. When I was a kid, my dad built us this really elaborate tree fort in the backyard. My dad was a general contractor, so you can imagine our tree fort didn't look like a lot of the neighborhood tree forts. I mean, this thing was built with studs. It had nice cedar shake roof on it. It had wood paneling or wood uh, siding on it. It had two entryways, one straight up ladder, one angled ladder. I mean, it was an elaborate tree house. My dad built it, you know? Made me think of reruns, and I want to clarify that these were reruns when I was a kid. Our gang, okay, Spanky and all those guys, okay, that was a rerun when I was a kid. But I'd watch these things, and on their clubhouse, it would have a sign, boys only, no girls, okay, sexist, okay. Well, you know, it's the boys clubhouse. You might remember such things. Well, that was their secret place. That was their getaway. 
Some of you married people have a secret place. Do you have a little romantic getaway you like to go to? Angela and I uh, had our honeymoon in Hawaii. I'll never forget when we were leaving there. I, I traveled internationally for the college I went to, and I, I had all these points saved up, and I had 50% off hotels. So it was, I mean, you couldn't steal it that cheap. So we went to Hawaii off all the miles and points I had. And she said to me one time, would you just promise me at least one time in our life we'll come back here? I said, hon, we're going to be in ministry. We're not in ministry for money. We probably won't have the money to come back here. I don't know. I'd love to say yes, but I don't know. And then I remember we got invited out to Ohana Baptist Church in Honolulu, where the Heats were after he left uh, Pohnpei and Guam. And so we went out there to Ohana Baptist, and Pastor Surfer said to me, well, you know, if I have an evangelist every three years, we have military people. They cycle out every three years, so they won't know who you are. So he said, I'd like to have somebody come every year. Would you pray about it? I said, I will. Amen. Yes. Okay, I'll do it. So we got asked to come out every year to Hawaii. I mean, you have to pray about that one, you know, right? But interesting, uh, my wife has now been to Hawaii, I think, 22 times in our married life. We've been married 28 years. And, uh, and we're going back this summer, Lord willing, and I'm looking forward to it just as much as I did before. Now we have kids in tow. But you know, that'll always be our spot. Our marriage got started out there in Hawaii, and not a bad place to start a marriage. And not a bad place to keep it going, by the way, either. Secret place. That's your spot. Ron Hamilton wrote a song I love. It's called My Quiet Place. Before I start each day, there is a special place. I love to get alone and seek my Savior's face. I find wisdom in his word to instruct me in his will. And I hear his gentle voice say, my child, be still. My quiet time alone gives me power to obey. My quiet time alone with God each day. I talk to him in prayer. Every day he meets me there, my quiet time alone with God. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Interesting, Jim Elliott, the famous missionary to Ecuador, to the Alca Indians, wrote a biography, autobiography, and it was called Shadow of the Almighty, based on this very psalm. I'll come back to that name at the end of this message. Remember that name, Jim Elliott, based on this particular psalm. So there is a priority uh, established. Your personal time with God is prioritized. But I want you to see something else, and that is protection from God is promised. These are the two premises, okay? Personal time with God prioritized, protection from God promised. Look at verse 2. I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Okay, so think about this. He's my refuge. You ever been to a wildlife refuge? We were coming back out of Canada one time, driving our trailer through Maine, and there's a giant wildlife refuge there, and it was a spot where bald eagles were commonly nesting. And, and y'all tell me something. What is, what's one thing you cannot do in a wildlife refuge? You cannot hunt. Yeah. Animals are protected from hunting or trapping there. Okay. Think of this. The Lord's my refuge. What does that mean? He's my safety net. He's my protector. In fact, he uses the analogy, he's my fortress. Okay, what's a fortress built for? Protection. Keep out attackers. Provide safe harbor. Okay, so protection from God is promised. Now, I will tell you this. This is one of the reasons I, I like the benefit of going to Bible commentaries. Now, you've got to have a balance when you read the Bible. Don't become dependent upon what somebody else says about the Bible. Uh, there are some denominations that discourage people from reading the Bible. Some say you cannot understand the Bible unless your clergy interpret it for you. That is not what God says. God says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So usually when I go to commentaries, it's after I've already worked my way through the text, I've done some word study on it, and I've prayed about it. And, and think about this. If you don't understand something in the Bible, what, what's the first thing you normally do? Google it, get a commentary, or call the pastor, right? How about this? How about you talk to the author? God wrote the Bible. When you're stumped by something, say, Lord, what, what does this mean? Scripture says of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth in John 16, 13. So He's your best, in, he's, he's the only qualified interpreter of Scripture. That being said, though, commentators have spent hours studying the Bible. If you find a good commentator who's true to Scripture, you're going to benefit by some things they point out. Well, I will mention that one of the helps that I got from this was John Phillips. 
John Phillips is a really good qual uh, commentator on Scripture. And again, with, you know, nobody's infallible but God. But he gave some really good insights on this, and I had not noticed this. He says in verses 1 and 2, there are four distinct names of God given. All right, this makes sense. We're establishing a premise here. It's built on the person of God. So notice these four names, and what do we learn about God here? Well, he says, first of all, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. The first name given is the Most High. That is the Hebrew name Elyon, E-L-Y-O-N, Elyon. What does Elyon mean? Well, the term literally means possessor of heaven and earth. Possessor of heaven and earth. Did you ever drive by an incredibly ornate house, an expansive house, or a beautiful property and think, I wonder who owns that? Well, Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God owns everything. God made everything. He's possessor of heaven and earth. So it speaks of his possession. But then notice there is the word almighty at the end of verse 1. I'll say of the almighty. Okay, who's the almighty? That is the Hebrew name Shaddai. S-H-A-D-D-A-I. Shaddai. What does Shaddai mean? Shaddai means a lavish provider. Lavish provider. Think about this. If God made everything, and if God owns everything, what is God incapable of providing for you? He says, my God shall supply all your need according to what? His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Gas prices are getting up near $3 a gallon. Yeah. I can't afford to drive back and forth to church anymore. Funny, you can still make those trips to Home Depot or Lowe's, but I can't afford to go to church every week, preacher. Y you think that took God by surprise? Funny, some people can afford season tickets to their favorite team, but boy, you know, I don't think church fits in the budget. I sure can't afford to tithe, that's for sure. Let me tell you, you can't afford not to tithe. Tithe is just a reminder that everything you have belongs to God. And tithe should go to your home church where you're being fed spiritually. Okay, well, he is the lavish provider, so it speaks of provision. Look at verse 2 then. I will say of the Lord. Okay, Lord, all capital letters. Interesting. Many of you know this. When you see Lord in all caps in our English Bible, what Hebrew name of God was that? Yahweh, Jehovah. We don't actually know how they said it because the truth is they didn't say it. Typically, we associate it with Jehovah or Yahweh. That was the, that was the personal name of God. Like you could, I could be addressed a number of ways. Uh, you know, evangelist, brother, preacher. Kids call me dad. Wife calls me honey. Okay, but my given name is Rich Tozer. Well, my legal given name is Richard Ronald Tozer Jr. Okay, Dick Tozer, my dad was Richard Sr. So I'm Richard Jr. But typically, people that just get acquainted with me, they just call me by my given name, Rich Tozer. God's personal name, if you will, is Yahweh or Jehovah. But the Jews so reverenced it, they, didn't want to, they did not want to be guilty of taking his name in vain. They substituted it with the title Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-I, Adonai, which means the Lord. That is why in our English Bible, you'll see Jehovah translated Lord. What does it mean? It means the God who is because he is. The God who exists because he exists. Sometimes people say, you believe in creation. God made everything. Well, who made God? Let me suggest to you, if you espouse evolution, you believe something always existed. You have to believe there was an eternally existent something. Either in the beginning God, or in the beginning gas. It's either creator or chemicals. Something was the original start of everything. Typically, the evolutionist says, well, there was, you know, what, hydrogen, nitrogen, whatever. And everything came from that. That makes sense, or does it make sense that there was an intelligent, loving, gracious creator that made everything by design? Everything, in fact, reflects design in this world. It's incredible, and I don't have time to delve into that in this message, but he is the I am that I am. He's the eternally self-sufficient, self-existent one. Okay, so that's the name Lord. Then there's one more name, and it's the end of verse 2, and that is the name God, my God. Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. E-L-O-H-I-M. Uh, and that is the idea of God the Creator. Speaks of His power. His power. You know, I don't think I, I gave you one in connection with Lord. Uh, his personal name, Jehovah, is connected with promise. He made a promise. Like, if I were to write you a check, the way I authorize transfer of money is I sign my given name on the check. 
Okay? When Jesus said to pray in my name, it's like, oh, and by the way, for all of you under 20 years old, we used to write checks, okay? They were paper little slips, and, and now you all have Apple Pay and, you know, PayPal and all that kind of stuff. We actually used to write checks to people, and you'd put on a dollar amount and to whom it was given, but the most important thing was you had to remember to sign it. If you didn't sign it, you didn't transfer money from one account to another. How many of you still use checks? Okay. All right. So, in Jesus' name means you're, you're asking God to transfer to your need, to your account, that which Jesus himself has authorized. Okay, well, he's, he's Jehovah. He's the I am that I am. And he's God. He's the creator. So, so think of these names. Speak of possession. Speak of provision. Speaking of promise. And speaking of power. In other words, there's nothing you're ever going to face that God isn't sufficient to meet. That's the premise for this whole psalm. Isn't that good? If I just stopped there and we went home, that'd be good. Some of you are ready for me to stop. But I do want to tie it together. All right, so let me pick up in verse 3 now. Let me give you a second area, and if these others won't take as long as that one. Second area I want you to see is a picture enhanced. A picture enhanced. This is in verses 3 through 7. A picture enhanced. Now, we all know this, that the Bible was given by inspiration of God. If you're a Bible believer, you've been told, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, 2 Peter 1.21. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16. We understand the prophets repeatedly said, Thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. And they gave the message from God. But I want you to understand that inspiration does not mean like robotic dictation. It's not that the writers of scripture somehow went into a trance and would write mechanically. God used their personalities. He used their vocabulary. He used their unique idiosyncrasies. Very interesting, Paul was probably the most literate, well, educated of all the apostles. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He'd been a rabbi. Peter was just a fisherman before he got saved. They both wrote books of the Bible. In fact, even Peter sometimes says, yeah, that stuff Paul writes, hard to be understood. So if you've ever had a hard time understanding some of the Pauline epistles, Peter's right there with you. He says, yeah, you know, a guy has a vocabulary to kill. Okay, so God used these writers with all of their uniqueness in their transmitting truth to us. Well, whoever was the writer of this particular psalm, I'm imagining as he's getting this message from God, he's thinking, how do I convey the reality of God? Now, again, God's working sovereignly through all of his unique abilities to paint this picture. But it's like an artist thinking, how do I take it from my mind and put it on canvas? My, my daughter, Brianna, is a graphic designer. And she loves creativity. She's always painting and creating. And Lene is following in her sister's footsteps, you know. And so I'll see Brianna. She'll dream up something and it'll come out on, on some paint project she's done. I said, where, did, where was the picture for that? She said, well, it's in my head, Dad. Man, I couldn't even get the picture in my head, let alone get it on canvas. You know, some people have a gift. Well, this writer says, let me convey to you who God is. So here's the picture enhanced. He uses two analogies. There's the bird analogy. And there's the battle analogy. One of the things I learned about Hebrew poetry is so different than our modern poetry. You know, English poetry, we typically have meter, da-da-da-da-da-da. We have uh, rhyme often. Hebrew poetry didn't rely on those things. In fact, Hebrew poetry often used the first letter of Hebrew alphabet, or it did um, something called parallelism, where you say something one way and repeat it another way. One of the things they did, they often would mix metaphors. Now, in English, we don't mix metaphors, okay? You wouldn't use a basketball analogy and switch to a tank battle analogy. It's mixing the metaphor. It happens all the time in the Bible, okay? So there's a bird analogy. There's, an, there's a battle analogy. I was going to call it the avian analogy and the army analogy. But I thought avian, some of you might be, what? You ever go to an aviary? What animal do they keep in an aviary? Birds. Okay, where does the term aviation come from? Things that fly, okay? But we'll use the bird analogy and the battle analogy. So pick up in verse 3 here. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Okay, so pause with me for a minute. Snare of the fowler. This is really easy. What do fowlers try to trap? Birds, yeah, fowl. You say, well, ah, yeah, obviously. When you read the Bible, don't miss the obvious. Okay, Th follow the analogy here. So he'll deliver thee from the snare, that's the trap, of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence. Okay, there are, there are natural causes that could bring death to some bird of prey or some, some bird in the, in the bushes. What might bring a bird down? Well, obviously a hunter or trapper. Also disease. Noisome pestilence. In fact, interesting. Noisome pestilence is the idea of a widespread 
disease or pandemic. Interesting, the word pandemic also comes from the term pan, although not the god pan. I told you his name is derived from all. Pandemic means disease that potentially could affect all. So pandemic comes from the idea of disease affecting all. Noisome pestilence is the idea of a widespread disease. Now, not saying that was a uh, bird disease or a bat disease, but follow on. Verse number four, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. Okay, think of a bird covering his feathers. I, I read of a missionary in Africa. He had gone out to see the remains of his village after a ravaging fire had come through. This, this missionary lived among people that were dirt poor. They built their, their huts out of clay bricks. They, they had the roofs thatched with grass. And this fire had come through the grasslands where this missionary ministered, and, and it had just ravaged everything. Huts had been burned to the ground. The people were left poverty-stricken. He's trying to focus on the gospel for these people, but they can barely think about, how am I going to get my next meal? What am I going to do about my house? You can imagine. So he's thinking, how do I communicate the gospel message to people who've been through such devastating loss? He's taking a walk one day outside of the village, and he comes upon the charred remains of a little bird nest. And here's a hen on top that had been burned to a crisp. The charred remains of this hen. And the missionary thought, you know, everywhere I look, there's just destruction. And he, and he kind of struck at the corpse with his boot, knocked the hen's body off the nest, and out scurried these little chicks. Three or four little chicks. And all of a sudden he thought of this psalm. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shalt thou trust. He thought, here's the picture I can use for my people. Somebody had to die so somebody else could live. And folks, the gospel message is this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's John 3, verses 16 to 18. See, Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God for you and me so you and I could go free, so we could live. That hen spread out her wings, gave her life, but saved her chicks. I'll cover thee with his feathers. Under his wing shalt thou trust. That's the bird analogy. But then, right there in verse 4, he switches metaphor. Notice the middle part of verse 4. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. This is why it's often called the soldier psalm. Here we have the battle analogy. The battle analogy. Okay, notice, his truth should be thy shield and buckler. Now the word shield there is a large, full-length shield. It's like one that would cover up most of the body. This is not like the Captain America shield, to borrow from the Marvel analogy. Okay, not like some circular shield that would defect, defect a bullet or deflect bullets from your innards. It was a full-length shield, a lot like you'd see in the uh, depiction of ancient warfare with these guys. They'd have spears and swords and shields, and, and the shield would literally come up to the chin or above their head. And when they put them side by side, it created a veritable wall. Now, the term buckler, that is a shaped shield. It was, it was like a semicircle. It would protect them from various angles of anything coming at them from the front. Interesting, it wasn't to protect them from behind. They weren't meant to turn and run. But as they were facing the onslaught of an enemy, it's got them protected. Front, sides, that's the idea of buckler. Uh, notice the next verse there, verse uh, 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Day or night, he'll protect you. Think about terror by night. It would, be, it would be horrific enough to be in battle in broad daylight. But how about battle at night? He'll protect you. And note, notice from the arrow that flieth by day. Okay, can you be at peace with bullets flying all around you? In their day, there weren't bullets, there were arrows. In the heat of the battle with arrows shoo, shoo, coming by, he'll protect you. Look at verse 6. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Interesting. Again, widespread disease. 
I remember re reading David McCullough's book, 1776, and he was talking about George Washington and the troops at Valley Forge. Many of the troops didn't even have shoes anymore. They'd worn the leather off their feet. All they had were rags wrapped around their feet. You've read it. If there wasn't money from the Constitutional uh, Convention to be able to pay for the, or the Continental Convention to, uh, to be able to pay for these troops, things did not look good. In fact, at the time, only about a third of the American population was even in favor of, of separating from Britain at the time. <laughs> good thing popular opinion didn't prevail. And what happened was Washington found that many of his troops were dying and they weren't even in battle that winter. It was disease, it was dysentery, etc. And I'll tell you something, anybody studies war, you realize this, threat of death is not only from an enemy. It can come from within, from the body, from ailments, from bacteria, from disease. And he says, you know what? I'll protect you from that. Notice the end of verse 6, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. That's like, that's like the munitions of war, total devastation. In fact, he says in verse 7, a thousand shall fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. I read rec or heard recently the story of evangelist Glenn Schunk. And he went off to uh, war when he was a kid. He said, I had just become a Christian. He said, I remember I would be praying every night by my bed. And he said, of course, a lot of the other GIs would give me grief about it. And he said, but they realized I was serious about God. I would kneel by my bed. And he said, later on, they realized God was protecting Glenn. He said, I was assigned to machine gun duty. He said, I was in a machine gun nest. And they said, what is it? Glenn never gets hit. He comes home alive every time. He said, before he knew it, everybody wanted to be in my machine gun nest. And he said, well, I had a captive audience. I'd talk to him about Christ. Whoever was there, he said, they weren't going to run and leave because they were under fire. So he said, I had a captive audience. He said, sometimes I led people to Christ who died just minutes or hours later. He said, and I didn't take any hits until the end of the war. And then I took some shrapnel, and that was the end of my career. But he said, God kept me alive so I could minister to all those guys. It's often been called the soldier psalm. If you do a search, I did it, Google, soldier psalm. You'll find lots of stories. Now, you always got to check it out. Did, did, did you know that not everything on the Internet is true? Just saying. So you, you got to make sure you verify, all right? It's always good to, to uh, trust and verify, all right? So I would find some stories. World War I, some amazing stories. But one of the best I found from World War II, it was the Battle at Dunkirk. A lot of people have heard of the Battle at Dunkirk. Famous movie made of it recently. And... You know, it was a, it was a world-renowned battle. Interestingly enough, the U.S. hadn't even entered the war at that time. This is before the U.S. entered the war. There were troops from Germany, I'm sorry, from uh, England and France pinned on the beaches of, Germ of uh, France there, and it looked like they were facing total annihilation. In fact, King George VI was um, the, the king there in England at the time, and he sent out word all over the British Empire, pray for our troops, pray for a miracle, because it did not look like they would survive. Well, people all over the British Isles, all over the British Empire, in fact, even in America, people went to churches, they began to pray that God would do a miracle at Dunkirk. Well, God did. Let me tell you about four events that occurred in answer to that prayer. One, Hitler ordered the advancing German armored unit to a halt. It's amazing, if you read the history of war, how many times there were tactical blunders made by leaders who were movers and shakers in world history. Hitler made a couple of serious blunders that really turned the whole war. Uh, Normandy was another example of that. Uh, and you know the story going back to the Spanish Armada and some of the other incidents of divine providence where God put his hand. Well, Hitler averted the advance of his troops because there was another incident that occurred. There was an unprecedented storm that had settled over France. At that time of year, it was, not a, it was not typical for there to be a storm like this. And because of the storm, the Luftwaffe, the German planes, could not fly. And so Hitler said, if we don't have any air support, then I don't want the armored units advancing. So he said, stop the armored unit. Now there's a storm over France. But something else happened. Number three, there was unprecedented calm over the English Channel at the time. Now, you know the English Channel is the body of water between England and France. And although the storm raged over France, on the, on the continent there, the waters were calm. That facilitated an evacuation that was absolutely historic. In fact, there would be over 338,000 troops evacuated from the beaches. 
they conscripted anything that floated. I mean, there were naval vessels, there were battle-type vessels, there were troop carriers, there were fishing vessels, there were pleasure craft. I mean, anything that floated, they started sending over to the beaches there in France. Men were taken on board and being transported back to England. This went on all day. And there's one more miracle. There's a group of 400 men from the Allies that were trapped on the beach there in France. They were taking heavy machine gun fire. They were being gunned down. It did not look good for this group. But this particular group of guys had all committed to memory Psalm 91. They began to recite it in unison. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. They're going through the whole psalm. Amazingly, not one of those 400 men received a single scratch on the beach that day. And by day's end, again, there had been 338,266 troops evacuated from the beach at Dunkirk. It's a miracle. Well, I want to take you now to the last part of the psalm because that brings me to the final observation. A promise elaborated. A promise elaborated. Look at verses 8 to 16. All right? That begs a question. So, like, if we memorize the psalm, maybe we have it inscribed in gold and wear it around our neck. Or, like, what if some soldier got this tattooed on his bicep? Well, then he's good, right? Is that what it's saying? Well, let's understand in context. Psalm 91, verse 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Okay, y'all know probably about the reward of the wicked. The wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah, only with your eyes you'll see the reward of the wicked. And then notice this. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That's very important. Because you, the psalmist says, made the Lord your habitation, no evil will befall you. Let me say this to you. He's not just saying anybody and everybody that quotes this psalm is protected. One of the keys, first of all, is this. You've made the Lord your personal habitation. Well, Rich, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for the whole world? I absolutely do. The scripture is clear. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Do you think Jesus' blood was sufficient to pay for the sins of every person who ever lived? I absolutely believe that. The scripture says he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2, 2. The scripture says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So then why did Jesus say, enter ye in at the straight gate, straight meaning tight, narrow, for broad is the gate, wide is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. So if the Lord died for everybody, then why isn't everybody going to heaven? Because not everybody has made the Lord his or her habitation. You must be born again. Oh, I knew we'd get around, you've got to join the Baptist church. Nobody here is going to tell you you've got to be Baptist to go to heaven. But you do have to be born again to go to heaven. What does it mean, born again? You come to the realization that if you got what you deserve, you would be forever separated from God. Well, I don't believe that. Well, listen, you're not getting to heaven based on what you believe. I'm not getting to heaven based on what I believe. I'm getting to heaven based on what God says. Truth of the matter is, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You say, I don't, I don't buy that. It's interesting. There was a theory years ago, and it was uh, given by a scientist who happened to be a Christian. He said this, you say, I don't believe in God. You say, I don't believe the Bible could be true. It was Pascal, Blaise Pascal, mathematician. He said, Pascal's wager, let's say you live your whole life under the assumption there is no God. And you die, and God is true, and you've lived your whole life believing a lie. What do you face? Separation from God, utter destruction. He said, I live my life in the belief that there is a God and that he's provided forgiveness through his son. I live my life and I believe in God and believe in his existence. And when I die, let's say it's not true. What have I lost? I've lost nothing. I, I've lived a life of faith, faithfulness to God. I've lived a moral life, etc. And when I die, if that's all a pipe dream, I didn't lose a thing. But if everything you say you believe proves not to be true, you've lost everything. Now, who's the fool? 
The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Let me tell you, it's absurdity for you to act as if God doesn't exist. He's given you ample evidence of himself. God doesn't say the fool has said in his heart because he's insulting people. God insulting is below God's dignity. He's saying it's absurdity for you to act as if I don't exist. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. But notice this. If you've made the Lord your habitation, they'll no evil befall thee. Look at verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Let me give you this then. The promise elaborated. He first says there is exemption from evil. That's in verses 8 to 10. Exemption from evil. You know, I was thinking about uh, Corey Ten Boom. I recently read her life story. Some of you read the book, The Hiding Place. I was reading a, a biography of Corey Ten Boom. She lived in Holland during the time of the Nazi occupation of Holland. Her family were devout Christians, and they had a soft spot in their heart for the Jews. They knew that God had said that the Jews were his chosen people, and he said, I'll bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. So they gave sanctuary in their home. They gave protection to Jews. They knew that at any time they could be arrested. They figured it was inevitable. Someday they would be. But they're willing to put their life on the line for their fellow humans. Their dad used to lead them in family devotion, family altar time. And one of the things they would do, they would recite this psalm. Psalm 91. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, it shall not come nigh thee. In fact, they were finally turned in by some neighbors. They were arrested. And they were taken to the state uh, to the city uh, jail where they would be processed. The last night they were all together, they stood in unison and their father led them in reciting this particular psalm. He was taken off to a camp. Corey and one of her close sisters, Betsy, were sent off to a camp together. Within 10 days, their father died in the camp. He was an old man at the time. Betsy and Corey were eventually transferred to Ravensbrook, Robinsbrook. They were sent to do hard labor. Betsy had all kinds of health problems. And they used to talk about it, and Corey would despair. She'd fret. Betsy would say, you remember what Father taught us. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. She would remind her sister of this, of this psalm. And Corey said, I know, but look where we are. She said, look at this. We're in a barracks that has fleas in the barracks. Betsy said to her, have you not thought of the blessing it is to be in a barrack with fleas? She said, blessing. She said, yes, a blessing. The prison guards will not come into this barracks because of the fleas. She said, we go uninspected here. They don't observe anything we do here. She said, we've been able to smuggle a Bible into this barracks. Don't you think we should share its contents with our fellow prisoners? And they began to do that. They began to have Bible studies in the prison, in the camp. Ravensbrook. they led many of their fellow prisoners to Christ before many of them died. Betsy said, Corey, I don't know that I will survive this war, but I believe you will. She said, oh, Betsy, you must not speak that way. She said, I don't know. I just think you will. And she said, when you get out of here, I believe you'll have an open door to go everywhere and tell not only of the atrocities that were experienced here, but there is forgiveness in God and his people, even though for those who are so filled with hate. Corey never forgot that. I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute. So there's exemption from evil, but there's also angelic attention. Look at verses 11 and 12. He'll give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. That, that correlates to Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I wonder, have you, have you ever experienced something in your life? You say, I believe there was divine protection. You know, it might have been a guardian angel spared me from accident or harm. Anybody ever look back and think, I definitely see that protective hand of God in my life. Any of you? I could tell you stories all night about times we averted near disaster. And I believe God fulfilled his promise. There's another one here. Not only angelic attention, but protection from predators. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. David Brainerd was a missionary to Native Americans, to the uh, Indian tribes at the time. And he was trying to reach them with the gospel, and they were not having it. In fact, there was a tribal chief and some of his braves that had pursued David Brainerd. They wanted to kill him. Brainerd didn't know they were following him. Brainerd was kneeling out in the woods one fall, and he's lifting his hands up, praying to God. And he doesn't even know these, these Native Americans are watching him. 
And the chief was about ready to have his men attack, but he held up his hand. All of a sudden, there was a rattlesnake came up behind David Brainer. It coiled into a strike position, and the chief thought, this is it. The great spirit of the sky is about to take out this pale face. Well, the snake coiled and then released his coil and slithered off into the woods. That tribal chief thought, Maybe the Great Spirit has just protected this man for a reason. Brainerd later met this chief and his braves and said, The Great Spirit has sent me, the God who created everything, has sent me to tell you of his son. And he said, You cannot harm me until God is done with me. And the chief said, He knew that to be true. And Brainerd didn't know about the snake. Right here. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. David Brainerd was able to lead that chief and those braves to saving faith in Jesus Christ, and part of it was they had seen the protective hand of God. Notice then 14 to 16, I'll finish with this. Deliverance for the devoted. Deliverance for the devoted. Look at verse 16. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I'll deliver him. I'll set him on high because he hath known my name. He'll call upon me, I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, so... Does that mean if I'm a Christian and I recite Psalm 91, I'm good. I don't have to worry about anything. Betsy Ten Boom died at Ravensbrook one week before she and Corey would have been released. Corey was then released. She went everywhere preaching, telling people about Jesus Christ, testifying, here's what God did in that, in that camp. When I say preaching, I'm talking about testimony of here's what God did, here's... And here's forgiveness. You've heard the story. One of the guards that was in their camp later became a Christian. And he met Corey in person. And he went to her and said, I've become a Christian. I know God's forgiven me. Will you please forgive me for the terrible things I did to you? She said, humanly, I could never have done it. But she extended her hand. She said, Lord, you'll have to help me. And she said this healing warmth came over her as she held hand, shook hands with her former prison guard. She went all over the world telling about God's forgiveness. I mentioned in the beginning of the message a man named Jim Elliott. He was a missionary to the Alka Indians in Ecuador. He and four others from Wheaton College in uh, Chicago end up going to reach the Alkas, Pete Fleming, Roger Yadarian, Ed McCulley, Nate Saint, Jim Elliott. They were reaching this tribe that had never had any outside contact. Nobody from the outside had ever survived. They were brutal uh, hunters, these people, human hunters. But Jim Elliott and his guys had been making contact, and they thought they were getting somewhere. They, they'd actually had an initial contact. But on the day when they finally had their first real encounter with the leaders of the tribe, they were all run through with spears and killed. So, what about that? Jim Elliott named his autobiography Shadow of the Almighty. Some psalm, that is. Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, and Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, later went back and they reached that tribe with the gospel. So what is it? it just, is it just like Russian roulette? Maybe you get the bullet, maybe you don't. Does God mean it or doesn't he? He absolutely means the promise of protection. Here's the point. He says in the scripture that all things work together for good to them that love God. There are times when he will have different fulfillment of his promise than you would expect remember god says my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways what's the worst that happens to a christian to be absent from the bodies to be what present with the lord he promises this he works all things together for good but here's what i want you to know he's promising protection unless there is some other purpose he is promising protection until he's done with you you know what that means you are basically inexpendable until God's done with you. So therefore, here's the question. Why do we live in fear? Why, I might die. You might. You should be careful, but let me tell you something. We don't mitigate all risks. Well, we try to mitigate them. We don't eliminate all risks. Okay, you try to mitigate risk. When you get in a car, it's a good idea not to get in the car when you're drowsy. You know, people in the world, it'd be a good idea if they didn't get in the car when they're drunk. Well, listen. Have you given up driving because of the possibility you could die behind a steering wheel? No. I am astounded how many people have given up going to church because you might get COVID. I'm not suggesting recklessness. I'm not, but you know, we do hear all the time, follow the science. Okay, there's fear, there's faith, and there's Fauci. 
Fauci changes his mind frequently, have you noticed? It's smart to listen to good counsel, but only God has infallible counsel. And you and I should not be living in fear. We need to live with eternity in view. Let me ask you, will you trust the Lord? I don't begrudge anybody being careful. Man, wash your hands. You know, if you're in a compromised situation, don't get out in public. Putting on the mask may help. Keeping distance may help. You know, not going out in public is definitely going to help if you're, if you're in a compromised situation. But don't give up on life. God's not done with you. Trust Him. Whether it's the mission field or the home front, God wants you to live in trust and make Him known in the habitation of the Most High. Let's bow our heads. I appreciate you listening tonight. Lord, there's a lot in this psalm, and I certainly pray that you will use it to be more than just poetry to us. You didn't give it just to be poetry. You made it to be life-changing. The key to me in this psalm is because you've made the Lord, who is my habitation, your refuge, therefore you'll have this protection. The key is we need a relationship with you. I pray you'd work in all of us to have a relationship with you. And a relationship with you is built on trust. Not on timidity, not on fear, but on trust. Our heads are bowed. I want to ask you this. What is the worst thing that could happen to you if you died? Well, the worst thing is if you died without forgiveness of sins, you'd be forever separated from God. That's the worst thing. There is a place that you could forever be separated from God. And let me tell you, he doesn't want you to go there. There is a place of destruction. It's called hell. And God's not willing that any should perish. That's where I'd be going were it not for God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. What does that mean? The pastor mentioned this week we think back to what Jesus suffered on Calvary. He, he bled. He died. He rose again. Why? Christ died for our sins. He says, repent and believe the gospel. Repent. Recognize your sins. See it the way God sees it. It's not... It's not acceptable. It's not excusable. But you can't eliminate it yourself. You can't cleanse yourself from it. You've got to be saved by God. If you call on the Lord, He'll save you. How many of you have trusted the Lord as Savior? And you say, thank God, Rich, I, I know I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I will one day. The Lord's my Savior. While heads are bowed and eyes closed, you just lift your hand that I might know. You say, yeah, I've trusted the Lord. Okay, I see a lot of hands. Amen. Let me ask you this. Does God know that to be true? Anybody can say, yeah, yeah, I, I know the Lord. Hey, does he know you? What do you mean? Jesus said on the day of judgment, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and thy name cast out demons and thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What? We did this and this and this for you. He said, getting to heaven is not what you do. It's based on whom you knew. Did you know me as Savior? Don't tell me what you did for me. Do you know me? If you don't know him as Savior, he doesn't know you as his child. He wants you to. He wants all men to be saved. Of any race, of any economic class, of any kind of background. Whether you grew up hating God or knowing about God, doesn't matter. He wants all men to be saved. He wants everyone to be saved. Is there anyone tonight you'd say, preacher? I don't know if I've ever come to right terms with God. Would you pray for me? I would never embarrass you, but I certainly would pray for you. Would you hold up your hand? Pray for me. I do not know. I want to know the Lord's forgiveness. I want to be saved. Is there anyone like that tonight? Pray for me. I, I don't know if I've ever received God's forgiveness. I'd like to call upon Him to save me. I'd like to know Him. Anybody like that at all? Scripture tells us, prepare to meet thy God. How do you prepare? You come to a saving relationship with Christ. That's how you prepare. In a moment, I'll give an invitation. I'll invite people to make a response. Many of you are Christians. Okay, listen. You've trusted God to save your soul. Can you trust Him to help you weather 2021? Hey, somehow you got through 2020, didn't you? Can you trust God for this day, this week, this year? Yeah, you can. Will you? How many of you tonight say, I, I needed that message tonight? Would you... Hold up your hand. I needed something I heard in that message tonight. I'll admit it. I needed it. 
Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of hands all over. Let's do this. If you would, look up at me and let's just stand together. We'll have one closing invitation here. I invite a response. If you need to be saved, the pastor's right here. I'd, I'd urge you to come talk to him. He doesn't save you, but he'll point you to Jesus Christ. He'll show you from the Bible. Here's what Christ did to save you. We'll show you how to call on the Lord so you can be saved. If you're a Christian, look, there's room at these steps. There's room at the front seat here. I want to encourage you to bow the knee before God. Lord, I'm sorry. I've been living in fear. I've been living in doubt. Lord, I've, I've kind of just given up on going to church or whatever it is. What does God want you to do with the truth you heard tonight? Let's bow our heads together. I'm, I'm going to invite you to come. There's a, there's a need in your life, and you say, I'm hearing you. We won't have a long invitation, but would you respond? God resisteth the proud, but he give grace to the humble. Would you come now? You might kneel right there at your seat. Some of you that are Christians, that's fine. See, I'm a little nervous about coming forward. That's all right. You said, Lord, here's where you're speaking to me. As Stephen plays through, pastor's going to come. He'll dismiss us in just a minute. There's time for response. I, I think tonight's truth is one of those you got to take it home. you got to mull it over. And you say, how do I apply this? It's like the doctor gives you the bottle of prescription pills for that particular need you have. doesn't do you any good till you take the cap off and you take it personally. God's truth is a medicine to be appropriate. I love the Old Testament story. So many great, great scriptures that are given to us. I love the story when Hagar, Abraham's servant, was rushed out of the camp because of jealousy and hatred. And I love it then when she was out in the wilderness that the angel of the Lord came. Hagar, Hagar, where are you at? Where are you at? What a God we have. That thrilled my soul as a teenager to just camp out in that passage. And some years later, she, she would have a teenage son and she was escorted out of the camp again. And the Lord again came, Hagar, what aileth you? And folks, I think about the heart of God. As we leave this place tonight, can I just tell you something and assure you of something? <laughs> The Lord's going to keep his eye on you, and he's going to keep calling unto us. And folks, I want you to understand that's the kind of love that our God has. He keeps calling. Where are you at? He knows where we're at, but he wants us to respond. Our God gives us that invitation, doesn't he? Come unto me. Come unto me. Come unto me. You know, even a baby, I think probably the first words a baby understands is come. Come unto me. What a heart we have in our God. And I think about our message tonight. Thank you, preacher. What a wonderful message. Were you blessed tonight? Oh, my. And I tell you what, I don't think the Lord's going to let up on any of us. The Lord has impressed our hearts with truths this evening of his love for us. And I pray that every time you turn around in the days to come, it's going to catch you. It's going to catch you. He's not going to let you go. And oh, I pray that one day your heart will be humbled and you'll cry out for him. Have mercy upon me, O oh God, a sinner, and call upon Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's the only one. He's the only one. He's the one that died for you.
that you may have life and have it abundantly. Thank you for coming tonight. What a good crowd for this Monday night. I love you. We have, we have thousands of people out in the gym, evangelistically speaking. Brother Tosha, would you hurry up and get to the floor before I get struck with lightning or you get struck with lightning? But I just want to thank all of you. We have several that are visiting tonight. God bless you for coming. It's been a tremendous time. Wonderful message. And I trust that you've been refreshed in your heart. Folks, let's don't panic. Let's don't give up. Let's don't quit. We've got a God that knows yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And guess what? He's on the throne. He's in control. I've read the last chapter of the Bible, and guess what? He wins. And all of his children, they're on his side. And I pray that you'll put your trust in him. Uh, let me thank you again for attending tonight. If you're here tonight, and there again, the Lord has spoken to your heart about your relationship to God. And you said, oh, boy, I just need to think about this. I need to just, you know, work through my mind and my heart. We have some packets. You go out the foyer to the left. There is a rack there and we have good news packs and we have some information shares with you scripture, of course, and it will guide you through this thing of knowing who God is and your need of him. And I encourage you, I encourage you take time to do that. Take time to do that. My, we study, we study the stock market. We study this and that. What about studying God? What about knowing about your eternity? Thank you for coming tonight. I want to have a word of prayer. Folks, listen, don't forget tomorrow night, service at 7 o'clock. Continue to pray. Let me encourage you to invite folks to come. Uh, let's just uh, put people under the sound of the gospel as was given tonight, that their hearts may be touched and challenged. And uh, let's really pray that God will do a great work in our midst. So don't forget tomorrow night. Hey, fellas, uh, we've been having a wonderful time out here under the, under the porch. Uh, prayer under the porch has been a wonderful time. And let me encourage you about that uh, at 6.30 tomorrow. And then, of course, 7 o'clock, our service. God bless you for coming. Father, we do praise you and thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you for this service this evening. Thank you, for Father, for these that have been willing to come and just expose their minds and their hearts to the living word that you've given to us. And, Father, we know that we're not talking about the works of Shakespeare. We're talking about the words of the living God. And Father, you will speak to our hearts. You will uh, cause us to recall much of what we heard in this message in the days to come. And Father, I pray that you'll be magnified as we hear these words and we bow the knee. We humble ourselves before you. We yield ourselves. And Father, I trust that you will show us the truth of your love for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you again for every man, every woman, every child that's attended this evening and in our two places of service. All of the folks that are streaming our services, may we be blessed. We have a God that we can look to and find the protection we need in this hour. We rejoice in you. Thank you. In Jesus' blessed name I do pray. Amen. Be safe going home.